Hello, everyone. Welcome to what used to be the 21 Hats podcast and is now the Business Advantage TV podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. This week, we talk about some uncomfortable topics, whether our panelists would know if it were time to close their business, how long it takes to really grow up as a manager, and what they have learned about managing and occasionally firing employees. I think my staff hears me, but eventually does what they want to do, says Dana. And that can be very draining because you wonder, well, why? I pay you. We've had training on it and talked about it. Paul tells us that while he's normally a pretty nice guy, he does have to put on his Jay Goltz face on occasion. So what does that mean exactly, asks Jay Goltz. I'd like to understand it. Even in good times, owning and running a business can be a lonely pursuit. Our hope is that these weekly conversations will, if nothing else, let owners know they are not alone in facing these challenges. This week's lineup features Paul Downs, who is founder and CEO of Paul Downs Cabinet Makers, which is based outside of Philadelphia and makes custom conference tables, Jay Goltz, whose businesses in Chicago include a picture frame business, artist frame service, and a home furnishing store, Jason Home, and Dana White, who is CEO of Paralee Boyd, a hair salon in Detroit. The episode is titled, My Jay Goltz Face. I want to pick up on something we talked about last week uh, when I asked Paul to talk about why in 2009 he, he thought his business was heading into bankruptcy and how he was able to avoid it. He talked about how it's never over till it's over and how a key order came in at a really important moment that helped uh, the company keep going. But but what I'd like to pursue a little bit deeper is the question of, you know, is there a line somewhere? Uh, unfortunately, in the middle of this pandemic, I fear that this is an issue that a number of owners are, are confronting. How do you know when it really is time to, to stop throwing good money after bad? Dana, I want to uh, pick up with you. Uh, when we spoke last week, you'd already closed one of your shops and you were concerned about uh, business being a little bit slow at your remaining location. How's this week been? Equally slow. It's just slow. I'm still in this holding pattern. And then have I thought about closing? Absolutely. Oh, man, I've thought about it because there's the people part of it. Um, and, you know, once you get in the back of your head ideas where you can make money, um, have a business and not have to deal with or work with the people part of it. Um, the, it, it, it does make you go, hmm, I wonder, especially over this pandemic, I thrive. Like I've been in my office, I've been working constantly. I've had this energy and I'm like, I'm wondering why am I so productive where pre COVID I was so burnt out and I was so drained. And it was because it was the people side of it. Yeah. When you don't have to you know, work with the people aspect of it, um, employees and customers, it makes, it frees you up, you know, your mental space to do a lot more. So getting back into that and causes anxiety and have thought of closing fairly void and pursuing um, other opportunities that have come to me. Dana, you talked about the, the, the people issue. What exactly are you referring to? I'm not able to afford to pay somebody to come in and kind of have the the business acumen and polish um, that I want portrayed, you know, or executed in my business. And so at times it can be very draining. I, you know, you have to tell somebody how to dress for work. You have to tell somebody how to answer the phone. Things that, you know, that I think are basic are not for everybody. And so, you know, even when you put people in place, I think the, I think I'm not a great manager. And I think my staff hears me, but eventually does what they want to do. Um, And that it's, it's, you know, that can be very draining because you wonder, well, why? Like I pay you, we've had a training on it. We've talked about it. Um, and then I also think a lot of it is industry related. I'm in the beauty business and these are creatives, right? And so they don't do well with structure. Some of them, some of them do, some of them don't. It's just that you're dealing with an industry that is used to coming to work, wearing whatever they want, getting there when they feel like it, leaving, even if there's a customer in their chair. I have to jump. Yeah. You've answered your own question. It's not that everyone does what they want. You don't want to be the manager of them. 
period. You've outgrown that. You're older. You've made six-figure salaries. You're used to being in a different world. You don't want to be the babysitter at that level because if you do babysit at that level, people will show up on time because you start to manage them properly. So this isn't about them. It's about, and I'm not criticizing you, you don't want to be that person. You don't want to be that $50,000 a year kind of manager that's going to say, I told you yesterday, you can't dress like that. If I have to tell you again, it'll be your last. You don't want to do that. And that's okay. You don't want to be that manager. It's draining that you have to keep telling adults. To Welcome to dress. the world of management. Yes. yes. It's management you have to 101. Tell adults what on time means, right? You have to tell adults. Yes. You can't call off because your two year old started talking to you. Let's let's be qu- yeah. qualify this though. It's not adults. It's sixteen dollar an hour people. R- managing sixteen dollar an hour people is very different than managing a sixty thousand dollar a year person. Mm-hmm. So, and you're not comfortable with it. You don't want to do it. Maybe there's nothing wrong with that. But mm-hmm. that is what running a retail business is. And mm-hmm. I don't have to do that anymore because I do have the scale. I can go pay the sixty thousand dollar salary, and they can mm-hmm. do that stuff. But it's a question of. Maybe you just don't want to do that, and mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. But it. Mm-hmm. But my point is, you can't get that under control. A manager will hire the right people, weed and feed, tell them what the rules are. This is how you dress. If they can't do it, you find someone else that does do it, and you can fix that. That is a fixable mm-hmm. thing if you want to be that manager. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that you want to be, though. Right. Dana, when I asked you about whether you'd thought about closing – you talked about both the slow business and the the management issue. It almost sounds like the management issue is is more paramount in your mind. Is is, is that right? No, to me, um, I think the slow business is what makes me nervous because I don't know why. I can't. I don't know exactly why. Nothing's been. You know, there's no letter that's been in my mailbox to say, "Hey, FYI, this is why it's slow." I've I've talked to customers. I've talked to um, other business owners, I've spoken, I've seen my trends and it should be slow right now. And we're in an, we're in a pandemic and in Michigan, you know, we don't know if we're going to close tomorrow or not. Right. We don't know what the governor's going to do. So, and people are still scared. So the numbers, I would feel much better if the numbers were higher, um, that I would. Um, and then as far, and then again, that allows you to pay people more, you know what I mean? Like it's a chain, it's a chain effect. And so, but I'm, I'm going to stay open, but when you have, you know, other opportunities of, you know, like a private label, hair care label coming up, you know, coming your way. And when you have opportunities to speak, um, cause people want to hear from, you know, people hearing me from the podcast and other things, Hey, Dana, you want to come speak? And you're like, wow, yeah, sure. Um, it just makes the grass look greener on the other side. But, you know, there's always a hefty water bill for greener grass. So you just have to be mindful. Uh, I have a question. Are the people who are asking you to speak, are they offering to pay you for that? So yes and no. So there's both. Yes and no. There's free speaking speaking engagements and then there's paid. Yes. Well, my, my observation having been in a business group that hosted a lot of professional speakers is the ones who make a living at it, basically, at least until the pandemic, travel all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started writing for the Times, before I sort of understood exactly what level of celebrity I was, uh, which is grade Z minus, um, I was (laughs) thinking I might have more opportunities to do that. And then when I thought about it, I thought, I don't even want to do that. I don't. I hate being yeah. in airports, and uh, so I think the the lure of being the you know the the wander around and talk to people uh, should be considered carefully. It's probably not as nice as you think. Yeah. And my issue is we the world's not going to. First of all, we're not only in a pandemic. You're in a very personal business, which is is you know to, you're right in their face. So it is going to end eventually. And I'd hate to see you make a decision based upon mm-hmm. today's reality than whatever it is, six months from now, you, it is going to end eventually. Lauren, are you with that? It is going to end eventually. Can you go with that? You and I might define eventually differently, but yes. Okay. It will end eventually. 
the question I still have is, do you want to be the manager of the store and deal with the setting standards, holding people accountable and responsible and, and doing that stuff until you get it big enough to where you can, in fact, have the $60,000 year manager and now you can become the leader instead of the manager? In my mind, that's the question. I want to follow up on what Jay just said. And just, I, th I think it's important to remember that when we started this podcast, which wasn't that long ago, you know, it seems like ages ago, lifetimes ago, but it was uh, in the fall of 2019, you had a thriving business and our conversation was about what you were going to do to expand it and how ambitious you were going to be about uh, taking your concept and spreading it around the country. Uh, so I, I want to follow up on Jay's point by asking you, when you talk about possibly closing, did you mean closing until things stabilize or did you mean closing? I meant closing and then, you know, reassessing and then opening someplace else. I see. So you, you could you could essentially mothball the business until this sorts itself out. No, that would be a part of it, but that wouldn't be it. It would be more of, OK, stop and what did you do wrong or what could you have improved upon and what could you do differently going forward? I still very much believe in the idea and the vision and the service that I provide. I'm not 100% confident that I am in the right city. I've always said that. I'm not sure that I'm in the right city for my business. You know, when you have a chain like Dry Bar or Blow, um, there's a reason why they open on the coast first, right? New York, L.A., and then move inward, there's a reason. And so I think to answer to Jay's, to answer Jay's question, am I willing to do the management work? Yes, I am, because there's not only more to do, but I could be better at doing it. And I don't think it's fair to my staff. I don't think it's fair to the lessons that I owe myself in order to just say, you know what, this is hard. I'm going to stop. I don't like doing it. It's not doing what I wanted to do. Let me stop. No, there is still work to be done in growth for Dana as a manager, because in order for me to bring in somebody eventually making sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, I have to be able to identify with their position and I have to be able to manage them or be able to look at their job and understand. Right. And, and I can now and it's been draining now, but I, I think I owe it to myself and to my team to do better. Um, yeah. And my point is you absolutely could do better. You're, you're not used to managing at this level. I am. And I can tell you that the J of 2020 is light years away from the J of 1990. Like I get it now. You mm -hmm. set standards, you hire people, you explain it to them. You talk to them two or three times when they don't do it, you replace them. And eventually you end up with a staff that actually shows up on time. I have none of those problems I used to have. Everybody shows up on time, dressed properly, happy to take care of customers. You just haven't gone through the learning curve yet of realizing it doesn't have to be like that. There are enough people in the world who will show up on time and do the right job. You just have to, and, and, and you're on that learning curve. So I am confident you can get this under control. How did you imagine it was going to go? I mean, this sounds so standard to just about every business I've ever heard of where you you get in and it turns out to be different than what you thought and the people turn out to be the big problem and uh, there is a solution. Um, and as Jay said, you'd have to start weeding through your staff. And then, you know, at a certain tipping point, good people attract good people and the bad people start to become the focus of attention because the manager and the, or the owner isn't spread so thin. And then, yeah, as Jay said, your, your, your team can, can stabilize in a way that makes life a lot easier. So we're light years away from where we were this time last year. This time last year, it was a hot mess, what was going on. And, and that's what I, I had a manager in place that would nod and smile at me and then go do what they wanted to do, right? And so that can happen. We have now hired a manager um, who has done much better, helped turn the place around, but she's, you know, going through some personal things right now. And there was a learning curve for her as well, right? Um, my issue with my managers is that I have hired momagers who say, well, Dana Janie can't get a ride. Her Dana Janie's mom wants her to be, we close at seven. Jana, Janie's mom wants her to leave at seven. 
So that means she's not doing any of the end of the night of work stuff. She's not doing any of the finishing the final customers. And so it's like, well, now maybe we should close early so Janie's mom can have Janie out at seven o'clock. Those are the situations that have been brought to me and I'm looking. So I'm looking like, really? This is my typical training of managers. I wait like three weeks before they say something like that. And then I have to remind them, that's why you were making a six-figure income and were successful in life. Mm -hmm. These are not you. And I I tell the manager, if they thought like you, I wouldn't need any managers. So I I can count on it. I can wait one week, two weeks, three weeks before they come into my office and go, oh, my God, can you believe it? So-and-so, blah, blah, blah. I go, yes. That's why they make $16 an hour. And that's why you're making $50,000. To answer your question, Paul, what did I expect? I expected me at that level and I expected I expected me at that level. I have never managed at this level. When I managed everybody, I think the lowest person was making sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, the people under me. So I wasn't I I've not managed retail an hourly before. And again, I'm not doing it day to day. I'm working with a manager right now. Um, I'm working with two managers right now and they're doing well. Um, but I already see, you know, room for improvement. And before I put this at their feet, I've put it at my feet. And I'm wondering how could I be a better leader first? And, and that's literally what I'm writing about and thinking about right now. How many stylists do you need? Um, right now in my salon, we are, we're good with four. That doesn't sound like an impossible number, but I, I got to say, um, Jay, you, you just have to be open to the possibility that different businesses are truly different. No, it's and, clearly it's different. And it might be a little harder, but some of the basics that she's saying are the exact same things that I went through, the exact same things that you went through. It's not just because it's a hair salon business. It's right, about the well, hiring process. It's about the management process. Yeah. And also the training process. So mm-hmm. I think that one of the things that, um, help me was to make a very clear set of rules and then enforce them. And uh, so that, but then also always expect to repeat yourself and train people. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just what, it's just how humans work. Like think what's the most successful form of organization humans have ever invented. It's a religion. And what do they do? They sit you in the same place every Sunday and tell you the same thing over and over and over again. And they don't expect it to be any different. And that's just the way people are. Now, please let me be clear. My staff is good. This is, the examples I'm giving you are from past. The staff I have now is by far one of the best staff I have ever had. But Dana needs to be a better leader. And Dana needs to provide more, and be less friendly, be less nice. Dana has to do less asking and more telling. But Dana, I, I have to ask you, if, if the problems that you're describing are from the past, w- why did you bring it up in terms of your thinking about whether... You- Great question, because they percolate every so, ever so often. They're not as frequent, but I'm still tired of it. Gone, You've got but- PTSD. I mean, that's, that's just after 2009, I, I had the same thing, which is, you know, just certain things would trigger me and it would just be like exactly. a wave of, of exhaustion and depression. Right. And so when these little things percolate again, you're like, oh, here we go. I have managers and leadership that get it now, but I believe it's on Dana to be less asking and more telling. And that's Dana. Again, I keep saying this is a Dana issue. It can be hard to do that. I mean, it's, it's hard to go if you're, if you're, if you're not comfortable just telling, I have a very difficult time with it. And, And the way I got around it was by writing down a bunch of rules so that, when somebody breaks the rules, I could say, it's the rules. And and I have, you know, like a whole procedure I've worked out about how to discipline and fire people so that mm-hmm. I can go on autopilot and just perform that. I mean, being yeah. a boss has a big performative element. And mm-hmm. so most days I'm pretty happy, nice boss. And then every now and then I got to put on my uh, Jay Gold's face. Okay, <laughs> now, fire somebody. I was already going to object to the nice <laughs> boss thing because people conflate nice boss. This isn't about being nice or not about being nice. It's about, and I, and I would also say, let's change the word rules to standards. It's about having standards, making mm-hmm. sure everybody on the interview understands what the standards are. We have to show up to work on time. That's part of the gig here, blah, blah, blah. And holding people to 
standards. So when you hold people to standards, it doesn't mean that you're not nice. It means that you're acting like the boss. Like I told you when I interviewed you, I need you to do here on time. This is your third late. I have to tell you, if you're late again, you're going to force me to fire you and that'll make me unhappy. Is that not being nice? I, so, no, do- that's what I'm saying. My managers are really good at that part. This is what we talked about in the interview. This is what you're not doing. And they manage, we have hiring and termination standards. We have processes for everything. And so for Dana, Dana being nice means when I say, hey, we're going to start wearing uniforms and my team will say, well, Dana, we don't know about that. Well, 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 well. Instead of considering what they're saying to me, I'm done considering what they're saying to me. I want uniforms because the people are not dressing for work that represent the brand. So we have to put them in a nice uniform. And, and instead I can of tell me, you that could be a huge mistake that you're in an artsy, I'm in a, I'm in an artsy business to go tell everybody we're going to start dressing like Burger King. I got to tell you something. But if you there's, dress like Burger King, it's a problem. No, there no. There's somewhere in between you. uniforms and saying, here's what dressing properly means. And, and we've done that. We've done that. And it does not work. How does it not work? What is, give me an example. They walk so in and they're wearing. They walk uh, in and say, well, either I got dressed this way or I was going to be late for work or I wasn't going to be able to come. We're going to nip it. And my team agrees. We need a uniform. And it doesn't mean a Burger King uniform. There are stylist uniforms. Dry Bar has uniforms. Right. There are very stylish, very creative. And it's not all the same one outfit. Here are the five tops you could choose from to wear to work today. Here are the four pants you could choose to wear to work today. Choose from these. So it's like when when a restaurant server, they're all wearing a white shirt and black pants or something. There's there's a fair amount of latitude. Exactly. Because I think that is a little bit different from a uniform. It's not like Burger King, here's a burger on your hat, here's a hat. No, here we're going to order four tops and four bottoms from this company. Pick which ones you want. If you want anything else in this line, you pay for it. But we're going to buy these many for you so you have uniforms for work. And it's not, and I want my staff to be able to take their uniform and go out with friends after and people not realize they're in uniform. Which you can't do wearing a Burger King outfit. Just You can't do it. So. You would right. show up and be like, you just got off of work. So there's right. a way to do it, but I've tried. Here's what I'm here. hearing. Yeah, Here's what I'm hearing. Code. You yeah. still haven't accepted with being, you're in retail. You can argue with that. Retail, dealing with customers. Um, the difference between you and I, I grew up working in my father's store. Mm-hmm. I got it. I started the mm-hmm. business. And every single thing you complained about, there are people that own frame shops that could go through the same tropes about, oh, these people, the customers, the employees. When, like, they don't get it. I get it. That's why my business is 20 times bigger. I have nice people that show up every single day on time and do a nice job. I have nice customers. And I don't let those customers once in a while get to me. But you're you're angry. You're you're frustrated. And I'm telling you and tired. And I'm telling you, if you change, if you you first of all, I would go back to the hiring process and say, did she have a job before you? And did you check references? Because oh, check references. And there, let me tell you, the Oscar goes to when we interview, we have some <laughs> of the best Academy Award winning people sitting in front of us. It's not until later that, and they show who they are. The interview, they come wonderful. Again, maybe it's because they're creatives at the interview so well. I don't know. But they interview marvelously. We don't Wait, what about the reference? Though. What about the reference? So references are glowing. And guess what? Come to find out, references may not even be true. References might be a cousin. References might be a friend. Okay. One thing to look for is is uh, what's the correlation between people who actually interview well and success? Because mm-hmm. my in my industry, if someone comes in wants to work on the shop floor and they're articulate and they're outgoing and they're friendly. That's not what you want. The real mm-hmm. successful woodworkers sit there in front of you and sweat and 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 can't answer a question mm-hmm. and because they're not about communicating. They're about doing something with their hands. And mm-hmm. and so I I really hesitate I... to to offer, you know, like wise advice from from an, an utterly ignorant person. That's what I I know nothing about this industry and I know I know extremely little about Detroit and and what it's like to live there. And so, you know, I, I feel like it's possible that your business model 
is would work great in a different place. And you're just adding an extra burden to yourself by uh, where you've decided to be. You're the and that's, fourth that, person to tell me that this week. <laughs> like you're the fourth person. Well, but he's, but he's we're not all right or that. He's guessing. That's my he's guessing. He doesn't. Well, I, I, I mean, there's there's no doubt. You know, like one of the things that I confronted right when I started was um, uh, I said to my mother, oh, I want to be a woodworker. And she says, oh, you're going to go to Vermont and, and, and live in a barn. And it's like, no, I'm going to live in Philadelphia where people with money are. And uh, and I realized, you know, like pretty early, I figured that it would be a good idea to be where the money is. That that's a, that helps. Smart. And um, I think that's pretty basic in, in any business. If you have more affluent customers and and just like you're in a better place, then it's easier to sell things and mm-hmm. uh, sell and things for the, more money, which allows you to hire better people and it makes your life easier. But, but no you question. might also have have a, a desire to change your community. And and uh, I'm yes. aside from my major business, I'm involved in a nonprofit effort where we're working with adults with developmental disabilities, and they're challenging. And it's a it's a real burden on just the business. Like we're trying to have a functioning bakery, and that's tough enough. And then you add another mission on top of it. It's almost like well, it's almost impossible to get a regular business to go. And now you're going to add some social mission that changes your parameters of decision making. That's super super tough. And I think that it, you just got to recognize that you've set up a difficult problem for yourself, mm-hmm. and there are solutions to it, and they may or may not be ones you want to execute. We're probably not going to solve this whole situation today. Um, I, in the time we have left, I would like to get back to the original topic, which is the idea of how you know when it's time to to throw in the towel. Jay, you're the one person here, I think, who has actually closed a business. Fortunately, it wasn't your your main business, but there uh, was a time a few years ago when the internet was young, and, and so were we. Uh, you put lots of money into an idea you had. Uh, it was kind of, uh, you've talked about it here before. It was kind of a sort of a 1-800-Flowers type idea, uh, but for picture framers instead of for uh, flower shops. It didn't work out. Eventually, you did throw in the towel. How did you know it was time? The issue was it was way past the time. It was a great marketing thing, I thought. I figured everyone's going to understand that for 150 bucks we could market together, advertise in shelter magazines, blah, blah, blah. I needed about three, 400 framers to, to do it. I got up to two, 250, and then people started dropping out because – Oh, well, I didn't get any new customers this month. And it like blew my mind because like if you get three customers a year out of this for what you're spending, it was worth it. And I had gone through hundreds of thousands of dollars because I was delusional and figured, oh, I'm going to fix this and I'm going to fix this. And I realized in hindsight that I should have pulled the plug faster because just because it was a good idea, quote unquote, doesn't mean that the average picture framer is going to get it. And that's why my business is 20 times the size of theirs. I went under the assumption that they think like I do and they don't. But what did you learn from that experience? Did you figure out how, how if, you, if you faced it again, would you know how to decide when it's time to call it quits? What I should have done, this is very simple. I should have simply asked the framers, how many customers a year would you would you want to get from this paying $150 a month? And if they said, oh, 50, I would have said, this isn't going to work. Because the reality is, if you pay $150 a month for a service to bring new customers in, and you get 10 customers a year, that's a home run. I mean, that's a couple hundred dollars for acquisition costs, which which is really good in this, in this business. I, these people had unrealistic, they would say, oh, I'll pay you for every customer you send in. They think if they spend $150 a month, they should have a customer every day coming in. And I, I if I would have asked first, I probably would have seen this isn't going to work. So now when I do speeches at the frame show, which I do every year, someone always comes up with this idea who wasn't around when I did this. And I go, hey, that's a great idea. I already had it. Let me ask you a question. How many of you will write a check right now for $500, blah, 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 and three hands go up? So it hasn't changed. They, they, they don't understand how marketing works. They don't have to understand you have to pay money to invest in it. And had I done a little more research first instead of just delusionally thinking, oh, well, I'm Jay Goltz. I built this gigantic frame business. They're clearly going to follow me because I know what I'm doing with this. 
that was the part that I should have uh, stopped myself. So it went on way too long. I went on for three, four years. I should have pulled the plug on it after the first year. I would have saved a lot of money. And um, yeah, oops. Paul, how about you? When you you talked about your experience 10 years ago, uh, you, you were you did not want to close your doors. And you've told us that you, uh, you, you know, until you until it's over, uh, it, it's not over. But I also know that you learned a lot about managing your cash flow. Um, did, did you figure out in that process how much cash you needed to have uh, to keep going? Well, yes. Um, you, you can model cash flows fairly simply just using an Excel sheet uh, and sort of, well, it's hard to describe an Excel sheet, so I won't. But let's just say it's easy to do it. And what it what it tells you is the day you run out of money and that day is always at some point in the future. And hopefully it's not next week. It's some months away because you're always run out of money eventually. Um, I mean, if you make a, a, a conserv- <laughs> if you make a con- what do you mean? You always run out of money eventually. If your model is conservative and you want it to be conservative, you don't want it to be a fantasy. You're going to overstate the budget for expenses and you're going to understate the income uh, and you're going to model out the future, and it'll just give you a sense of where that, where those lines cross. And I think that the big value of modeling is just so you get a sense of what normal looks like. And uh, getting back to what Dana said, like this is our slow time of year normally, and uh, okay, that's good information to know, so that when the business is not doing as well as you'd like it to, at least you have something to compare it to. Um, Now, I think that in general, when I confronted the idea of failing, I didn't I didn't really have any way to analyze it. There wasn't any model of what to do or what not to do or what to think about or what not to think about. There was literally no information about this available. And uh, even today, I don't think that anybody has. uh, Well, Jay's five point checklist is not bad, but it doesn't tell you exactly what to do. (laughs) And I got to say that that my sister. Uh, Carol ran a boss a, a restaurant in Boston that for the last 27 years community restaurant that got to be well known in her community and, and beloved and best year's revenue was last year about 2.2 million I think and uh, she just decided to close the doors in in uh, May because this recession basically killed her. And so she went through and she thought about, okay, we're going into this problem of being shut down at our lowest cash point every year. And it's the wedding business and the event business that puts money in our pockets over the course of the summer and fall. And that's not going to happen. And I owe all my vendors a ton of money and I've got rent and I've got people I got to pay. I can get a PPP loan, but I can't actually put anybody to work. So what good does that do me? And she just decided, that's it. I'm done. And uh, it was very sad. How's she feeling about it? It is sad. How's she feeling about it? She feels terrible about it. But she we were just she was just at my house yesterday and we were discussing it. And she said, you know what? There's a lot of other restaurant owners she knows who are trying to make it work. They don't have the option of, of shutting the doors because their entire life and all their money is in the business. And as soon as they shut it, they've lost it all. And I think that that's one of the things, getting back to Dana, if you shut the doors, I I have no idea whether this statistic exists, but I have a feeling that businesses that shut the doors, even for one day, have a much higher overall failure rate than businesses that never shut the door, where you just like, you just tough it out and you hope for the best. Um, Can't prove it. It's just a suspicion. And also the way that a lot of small businesses get financed is through people, the owners doing it out of their pocket, it's going to tend to lead to them going too far, to staying open too long, and to putting their last asset into the business in the hope that something will come along and turn it around. And so it's a really, I mean, it's sort of like a horrible problem to have if if you're desperate and you're dying and it's already sucked the life out of you. And what else can you do? You just got to try to keep open. You know it's not going to work. Um, 
that's just a tough situation. There is no, there's no question that there is a point to where it's good money after bad, and there's nothing. When, when all you have left is hope instead of an action plan, that's a problem. And there's no question. There's some people that should have called it quits earlier than they did because they were just hoping things would turn around, and there was no rational reason to think that was going to happen. And your sister might be one of those people, given that you know she lives off of weddings and stuff. That probably was the right decision for her. Uh, there's other people who have, you know, went to carry out model and they're doing okay from what, I mean, there are some restaurants that, that aren't as dependent on weddings and such. Well, she have, thought about that here. just to, just to add, you can, you could go to a carry out model if you feel like it, but that doesn't change the, the setup of your kitchen and kitchens where her kitchen was designed to minimize space because it's right. you know, another table. And so she didn't feel she could safely operate and put her people shoulder to shoulder in a kitchen and that it simply wasn't safe to do that. So, you know, no, it was probably the right decision, but uh, yeah, I'm just, it's, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. I'm not there yet. I'm not at that point where all I have is hope and no action plan. I have a few action plans because again, there were things that I didn't do. Right. So for me, I want to, 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 do the work, right? Get busy working um, and, and see what happens. And also, I think, Jay, you're right. I, I think it's a matter of not letting this season, this this hour, be, you know, indicative of what's to come. Um, I think now I, I've chosen to see this as an opportunity to fine tune, to become a better leader with my management staff um, and to, to do the work. Um, and, and put a team together, an administrative team, meaning bookkeeper and lawyer and making sure all of those people are in place and we're all on board with a vision and, you know, a digital person to help me grow the business. What is your plan to try to get more people through the door? Marketing. When I'm at home working, I'm looking at ways to market and I'm updating our standards. Dana, where do you think you are? Zero to 10. 10, you're the experience, know what you're doing, can do it in your sleep, blah, blah, blah. Zero to 10. Five. Okay. And I think that's probably accurate, which means you got lots of opportunity to, as you go up the scale quickly, it'll get easier because I think that's a, that's, probably a realistic number. You're going to get better at hiring. You're going to get better at setting standards. You're going to get better at management and it will get easier. I'm sure we will come back to these. Wait, I have to ask Paul a question before you finish. So what does that mean exactly? You're nice or that, or you put the Jay Gold's face on. I want to flush that out a little bit. Explain that. I'd like to understand that. I love Jay, that. If, I like if it. You don't know the answer totally to that good. right now. No, what, it, what it means is that, is that, um, as I said, I believe that being a boss is is a performance, and uh, you put on different faces for different situations. And calling it the Jay Gold, that's just a provocation. It just play. means no, no. It, it just means, means I can't give do what you have on, to do. It it means that now I'm concerned with the team, and I'm no longer yeah. concerned about you. Very good. And, it means you do what that, you have to do, and you and act like right. the boss. There's no and screaming. There's no humiliating. They're sitting down in right. the office very quietly and saying, you know what, uh, Paul, we've talked about this several times. It doesn't seem like this is the right job for it's you. Not even, Today's I don't even, your last it's day. It's not even a conversation. It's all written. I have a template. And <laughs> one of the things that- What, well, do you the, throw it at them? Well, how does that work? No, I down. You write down what the problem was. You write down when it happened. You write down what the witnesses said. You write down, here's the policy it violated. Here's what I want to have happen if you want to stay. Here's what's going to happen if you don't improve. Here's wow. how we're going to help you improve. You it's sound all like a manager. Of... Or a prosecutor. You but read that's it what like we, a manager. But here's yeah. the thing, but that's what yeah. we do. We have performance improvement plans. Right. We have reviews from them to us. Like we have reviews from us to them. Like we, the only thing that has been able to save our butt at Paralee Boyd is document, document, document. Because for us and for them, it removes feelings. So if you're acting out because you're in your feelings, because you don't like that we remembered that this is your sixth time or third time being late, here's the documentation. And they still escalate. I think the fear of failure Come and that's what the Jay Gold's faith means. We're we're gonna make that phrase universal. Jay is so confident and committed to his vision for his business that just because ex employee 
is upset because they're getting terminated, he has no question as to the moves he makes that he's doing the right thing. Me being only seven years old, I no question, question all the time. And believe I mean, oh, no. me, well, I've oh, said no. this before, Here's... seven years isn't a long time. I've said no. that yeah. before. I, I question all the time because I'm wondering, oh, well, this is an upset employee. Maybe, maybe they see something I don't see or maybe, no, I have to grow up. And I have to get into the habit of trusting my vision, even when the people around me don't. So I have to push back and say, no, respect the check. My name is on the bottom of it. That's why you listen to me. I got to finish getting there. I'm not there all the way yet. It takes many years. Like it took me 30 years to become a a decent (laughs) manager. And uh, I mean, the first 20, I didn't have any access to to real coaching about it, but uh, uh, it just takes a long time, and I think part of it is also that you you need to sort of develop a bit of a crust, and that's that's mm-hmm. uh, and you you don't necessarily want to let that harden on you, but you need to know it's there. You need to have it, mm-hmm. and you know one of the things about just disciplining and firing, I I make it very clear to my people that if we see that your coworkers are upset, you are a problem. And so that everything is, is, is part, you know, part of the team. And I don't think I've ever had a, uh, a, a firing where people weren't happy when I, when I completed it. And so that's one way, like if you fired people all the time and then you saw the other people looking kind of upset that that happened, that would be bad. But I bet you find that every time you fire somebody, everybody else is delighted. It's called being committed to your mission, which is to Mm -hmm. have happy customers and happy employees. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we don't have to apologize for it. And the big line I've learned to say to people is, you know what? This just might not be the right place for you. I'm not telling you that we're right. This is how we operate here. Maybe this isn't the right place for you or this isn't the right place for you. It's no one. We're not trying to brainwash anybody. It's not right right for everybody. The only failure of management evident here today is mine because I've completely lost control of this podcast. Uh, but I think that's a good sign that you, you guys won't let me break in and <laughs> and call it quits. Uh, but I got to do that. We have run out of time. Uh, we will pick up many of these threads again, I have no doubt. Uh, I want to thank Paul Downs, Jay Goltz, and Dana White for uh, being so open and honest as you guys always are. Thanks for listening, everybody. This episode was produced by Jess Thuberon, founder of Blank Word Productions. Remember, we started the 21 Hats podcast to help business owners feel a little less isolated, to let them know they aren't the only ones fighting these battles. If you got something out of this conversation, please help us reach more people. Tell a friend, subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at 21 underscore hats. And let me know if you have a question or a comment or a topic you'd like us to cover. My email address is lfeldman at 21hats.com. See you next time.